Check out award-winning Johnson & Boone Solicitor's unique product, Legal Guard. Ideal for businesses and individuals, Legal Guard ensures you get the legal help you need when you need it. Packages start from just £24 a month and include free expert advice, access to a library of legal documents, as well as exclusive discounts on a range of services. For more information, visit johnsonandboon.co.uk forward slash legal guard and quote the code for CHESH. You're listening to Johnson & Boone Solicitors Podcast exclusively on the Pod Station. Welcome everyone to another episode of the Johnson and Boom podcast. Uh, my name's Mark. I am the host, and joining me this week for a refreshing change. It's been a while since we've seen him, um, although technically we've still not seen him because we're in lockdown. So it, it's from what I assume is his home office. It's Jonathan Field from Johnson and Boom fame. How are we doing, Jonathan? I'm good, thank you, Mark. How are you doing? I'm not too bad. How are you finding working from home? Uh, it's a challenge, and it's a bit different, isn't it? it yeah, it, it's it's weird working from home. Uh, sort of get up in the morning, stumble into the office, get on with it, and then uh, get out the office, close the office door, and uh, and I'm still at home. It's just a uh, just weird. I suppose the biggest challenge for you is probably that you have to make your own coffee. Oh, tell me about it. He says um, he he says as he lifts up one of the biggest flasks of coffee I've I think I've ever seen. That's it. I've got to go downstairs and put the kettle on myself and everything, Mark. It's drastic. <laughs> well, desperate times call for desperate measures, of course. Now, if you're listening to this for the first time, uh, we'll, I'll briefly explain what it is that we hope to try and achieve from doing these shows. Um, I'll then ask Jonathan what it is that we're going to be covering today before I explain how we can check out all of those previous episodes. So, um the idea is that we touch on a top well why don't you explain jonathan why what it is that we try and achieve doing these shows uh, what we're trying to do is just give everyone sort of some rough ideas of areas of law that we cover as a business have a chat through them and you know it gives clients a general understanding of what the issues are and how we can help them and, and move matters forward for them fab and this is going to be episode 35 uh, and what are we going to be covering in this episode Wow, 35 already. <laughs> uh, um, today, Mark, we're going to be covering the Supreme Court decision on the business interruption insurance claim. Uh, so the claim was in the High Court uh, in September 2020. Uh, the matter was then appealed and leapfrogged to the Supreme Court, and they gave their judgment uh, on the 15th of January 2021. Okie dokie. Now, if you want to listen to some of the previous episodes if you go to the johnson and boone website johnson and uk you'll find a podcast tab under uh, useful information you'll find all the previous episodes there you'll find links to all of the major podcast platforms where you can also listen to it there is usually a subscribe option on those platforms which means that if you want to keep up to date with the latest episode then just click onto whichever device you use to listen to the show we're also showing the whole show now on youtube we haven't quite quite got use we haven't quite yet stretched to doing a live recording um and showing our faces uh, i think so far rob and i are very much of the opinion we have the face for radio i'm yet to be convinced that john he's nodding uh, <laughs> he knows where i'm going with this i'm yet to be convinced that jonathan falls into a different category to that of rob and i so i think we'll we'll, we'll save the public that for now yeah, that's fine with me, Mark. Uh, you can also listen to the show on the Johnson & Boob mobile app, which is free to download both on Apple and Android app stores. Uh, if you go on there, download it, you can listen to the show on the podcast tab. There's actually a whole host of other features on there, so you can book appointments with the team, you can get in touch, you can see what services are on offer. Uh, you can also access the Legal Guard membership scheme, which Johnson & Boom do. It's, it's an extremely unique product, 
which you can actually find out on one of the previous episodes that we've done. Um, and if you visit johnsonandboo.co.uk forward slash legal guide, you can find some more information about that. It's well worth checking out whether you're an individual or a business. So without further ado, Jonathan, let's roll up our sleeves and get in, stuck into this because it was a very complex thing to begin with i suspect it's probably still equally complex and i guess for the benefit of people who might not have heard the initial um show that i did with rob on this do you want to give just a little bit of background information as to where it comes from and how this all started a lot of businesses took out business interruption insurance and obviously when covid hit back in march 2020 uh, a lot of businesses applied under their policy for coverage and to be indemnified for their business interruption claims um, following the mandatory closures that were issued by the government um, at that time in order to suppress the disease. Um, not surprisingly, a lot of the insurers just said, nope, you're not covered. And um, a lot of people complained about that issue. So in due course, the Financial Conduct Authority took hold of the matter and they issued a case um, against several insurers um, to ask the High Court to determine what the interpretation of the policy was and what some of the meanings in relation to the policies actually meant, given that there was so much uncertainty uh, around certain policies and clauses. Um, the test case didn't deal with all of the business interruption insurance clauses. It only sort of dealt with the non-damage clauses. So anything that was extra to the insurance that wasn't relating to property damage. Um, it's kind of been accepted, I think, that COVID-19 couldn't cause any property damage. So the FCA didn't look too much into that uh, when coming to the High Court. Um, and the High Court gave their decision, as I said, in September last year. But unfortunately, the insurers and the Financial Conduct Authority didn't necessarily agree with all of the findings. And an appeal was brought to the Supreme Court uh, and what I hope to go through with you today is the uh, outcome of the case that the Supreme Court found and, and where matters lie now. I mean, we should say at the outset that the idea of these shows is to provide a very cursory overview of the area, not to necessarily delve into the real specifics. And I say that specifically with this topic because it because it's so incredible incredibly complex um as you say that there's an awful lot of these every policy is different and the wording used is different and how that wording is applied is different and that can be something as silly as a full stop being in a different location and therefore changing the context of a, a sentence and the courts were very much trying to get to grips with sort of an overriding position on this, which I'm sure you're going to come to on that and not necessarily to, to get stuck into the minutiae of each and every individual's business insurance policy. Um, so uh, with that context in mind, guys, if you do have any questions or you do think it might be something that's relevant to you, it's very much a case of give the Johnson & Boone team a, a, a call uh, and they can look at your individual case in your specific circumstances as opposed to the overview that, that Jonathan's going to look to give us today. So, Jonathan, what, what did the Supreme Court actually look at this time round? Well, there was only sort of specific appeals on specific points. So some of the original judgments stood and the appeals were only brought in relation to some of the issues following off the back of the High Court judgment. So I think there were about five or six points the Supreme Court looked at over and above the High Court, and uh, I'll go through them sort of individually um, through this podcast and try and address and sort of explain the issues that came out there. Splendid. So what 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 was the first thing that they looked at? So what they were looking at first of all was the disease clauses. So what particularly was the coverage and, and what came out from that? So the main issue that the High Court looked at was a notifiable, what's called a notifiable disease clause. So typically the policy wording would have been something like um, the occurrence of a notifiable disease at the premises or within a radius of. Now, some policies have one mile, some have 25 miles of the premises. Now, the issue that came from that then obviously is that 
we have to determine what all of that actually means. And, you know, sometimes it's a bit of a minefield as to what each individual word means on that. Uh, within that, the sort of several bits that were taken apart by the court. And, uh, you know, we just got to sort of analyse what that means and apply it to each individual policy, as you say there. So what was the basis of the appeal because you've you've already, I mean, when we were saying how complex this is, it's suffice to say we've only touched on the first point. There's already a whole host of things about what is a notifiable disease, who's it notified by, what is the radius in which it affects. I mean, th- these are just minutiae things of just option number one, um, yeah. uh, which kind of gives people an idea. So what was the appeal basis of this particular disease element? So the High Court had kind of taken a quite a broad view of sort of where was the occurrence and and within the radius as well. They kind of took the view that COVID-19 was everywhere and as such the policy shouldn't really restrict to only the cases that were happening sort of within that radius or um, at the premises. Um, the High Court's view was that the notifiable diseases covered by the policies included diseases that spread rapidly. And so to restrict cover to local occurrences only would not make any sense. So I think what they were trying to say in reality was that there's more than one sort of factor that needs to be taken into consideration when looking at what is um, within the radius and what's not within the radius. So was there multiple causes or, or was there one cause? And that caused a bit of bit of an issue um when it came to sort of interpreting what you do from here yeah it it's very much the insurers were wanting you almost to show that someone had covid in the within the proximity of your business which is impossible to do because of course you don't know who's got it and even if if there is somebody how the hell you would track that down as an individual business is is beyond the realm so I, I, that was kind of the argument was it the insurers were saying well we want you to show that your particular business is affected by people within that area and obviously the fca were taking a slightly more broad broad brush approach which is it's everywhere people there's no escape yeah well that's it i mean logic would say yeah it was everywhere that's why the government took the action that they did but when you're looking at an individual policy and, and whether that policy attracts cover you've got to be a little bit more specific than that unfortunately the court the high court's view that it was everywhere just didn't quite sort of grasp the issue Supreme Court sort of reined that in a little bit. Um, they looked at it differently from the High Court. They said that any occurrence of a notifiable disease within the radius would provide cover. So what they weren't looking at was the multiples of cases that were happening beyond that. The High Court sort of said, well, if there was a case outside of the radius that brought a case inside the radius, would that do it? But the Supreme Court says, no, you must have something within the radius to provide that cover. Um, the occurrence that they found was that obviously it's got to be um, the occurrence of a specific um, specific identifiable uh, individual so what they said an occurrence was was an illness sustained by a particular person at a particular time at a particular place the occurrence was not the disease of COVID-19 itself as the High Court was trying to say but that there must be a specific occurrence by a specific person at a specific time that's caused the the loss within that radius. Okay, so uh, I, the the Supreme Court were rather trying to remove the word COVID out of the situation and say, well, look, this is how we interpret the rule as a general, because, of course, there might be another version of a COVID coming down the track and I, I presume they're trying to to preempt that with a, a, a you know with a, a conversation as it were yeah well that's it it's, it's trying to keep it all together and, and trying not to bring more satellite litigation off the back of it and what they've tried as best to do is to bring it all down in one judgment and hopefully to uh, prevent more and more cases coming beyond it albeit we probably will have to see some further litigation cases to determine further wordings and further clauses there. Okay, so what was the second thing that they looked at? 
What they also looked at then were what they called the prevention of access and hybrid clauses. Um, so roughly what the example for one of those would be, we take it from the Hiscox insurance policies. So they had what's called a public access um, denial clause. So the way they worded it was an incident occurring during the period of insurance within a one mile radius of the insured premises which results in a denial of access or hindrance in access to the insured premises imposed by any civil or statutory authority or by order of the government or any public authority for more than 24 consecutive hours. Um, essentially what they then provide then is this cover where a public authority has ordered the premises to be closed, as is what happened back in March last year when the government made announcements to say Obviously, you're going to have to close your business to suppress the disease. And what was it that the uh, Supreme Court then was actually asked to resolve from the first finding? A few things on this one. So what they were looking at was what was the nature of the public authority instructions to close. So the High Court had initially ruled that it was only the mandatory statutory regulations that came into force on the 21st and the 26th of March last year that would catch for this close, but catch for this clause even. Um, so essentially the instructions given by the UK government to close that did not have the force of law would not provide cover. Um, the High Court had looked at that rather narrowly and they said that there must be a complete inability to use the premises. Anything short of full closure would not be a prevention of access to the premises. Um, so giving a rough example on the High Court decision. So if you have a restaurant and that restaurant offers takeaways as well as in-house services, um, if the takeaway aspect of that restaurant was still open as was allowed under the regulations, they couldn't claim for any losses that the restaurant itself incurred because it wasn't a complete and utter closure of the premises. So what did the Supreme Court change then? Well, they looked at the requirements of what the authorities were putting in place to close. So they looked at it to say that the restriction imposed didn't require the full force of law. So it was sufficient if the terms and context of the public authorities instructions was enough to be reasonably understood to be required without the need for legal powers. So a uh, rough example there. So when the Prime Minister announced on the 20th of March to name businesses to close, so I think that's when he named pubs and restaurants, etc., to close, that was enough to be an authority to close. They didn't say it had to be followed on them by the regulations as long as it was reasonably understood that that was what was required as the terms of the powers. What did they say about the ability to use the premises for part of the business? Because that leaves a massive grey area. Some businesses were told specifically they were not allowed to open, period. Some businesses, and you've just given an example there of restaurants where they were told to close, but in actual fact could try and find a way to perhaps keep some form of income going, even if it was a massive detraction from what their normal business was. So a restaurant doesn't normally do takeaway, but some of them were forced to adapt to become almost a takeaway in order to keep some form of trading. Yes, well, that's it. I mean, the High Court sort of addressed that issue to some extent as well. But what the Supreme Court said on that, Mark, was that they've revisited the inability to use the premises bit so whilst the closure must be complete, it doesn't mean that the whole business must be closed. So it must be a specific part of the business that was required to close. So going back to that example again, so the restaurant could now claim for losses, even though they were still open for the takeaways, because the restaurant was a discrete and separate part of the business that was required to close. So in effect, if you were if 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 you had to alter your business substantially just to try and keep some money coming through the door, you were still able to claim for some of the shortfalls that were caused by the fact that you couldn't keep on doing what you would normally do because you were told that wasn't permitted. Exactly, that's it, Mark. So if you were sort of in that position where you were just a restaurant, you didn't normally do a takeaway beforehand, 
but then you diversified to allow your business to do the takeaways, you can still claim for the losses that the restaurant has incurred. Um, but obviously any profit that you make from the takeaway element would have to be taken into consideration in making um, your financial loss calculations and determining how much you've actually lost. And again, I, I guess I would say if, if anyone's unclear on that, it's very much worth getting in touch with you because there's there's a whole host of other grey areas as well, I suppose, whether businesses who necessarily weren't told they specifically had to close but needed to close because of the real risk to staff in being able to carry out their jobs it, it, it's just an endless minefield of possibilities isn't it yeah there's a lot to be taken into consideration and there's a lot of factors that will determine whether or not the policy would provide coverage um, but yeah we'd have to assess that as you say on a case-by-case -case basis and advise accordingly now next on my list i've got causation now do you want to just explain to people what we mean by causation because some might not necessarily understand and then how it's relevant in this particular instance yeah causation then so what is the legal basis of the claim what sort of allows you to bring that claim and on what basis are you bringing it does the loss follow from the event essentially textbook answer love it yeah, thanks, mate. <laughs> so, yeah, it, it's just a case of does the loss follow the event? Get so, so, so in, in so in in this instance, um, what we're trying to show are we that that COVID was the cause of the loss? Yeah, what you've got to show in this nature is, is that there was an event that caused your business interruption insurance policy to provide coverage. So, it's not necessarily so much that it was the COVID nineteen, but what was the reason your business closed? So in the examples given before, some of them were forced to close because the government told them to. Um, there were other examples where there's, has there been COVID at the premises that forced the closure? Or has there been a diagnosable case of COVID uh, within the radius as specified within the policy that forced the business to close as well? Yeah. That very much ties back into the previous point that you made, actually, where they were looking at whether or not the government had specifically told you you had to close down. Well, in the example you've just given there, where if a member of staff has tested positive, it actually might cause the entire rest of the business to have to self-isolate because they came into contact, in which case you're essentially forced to shut down, even though you might not ordinarily be a business that can stay open. It's a little bit of a grey area still on that one. If the business itself wasn't required to close by the regulations or on government advice, but then had to close because there was an instance of COVID at the case, we'd have to sort of review the individual policy and consider the individual circumstances, but it might only be the case that they, that they would only be covered um, for a period that required them to close, deep clean the premises and then reopen, obviously subject to having sufficient staff being able to reopen and things like that as well again i'd stress and i'm 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 kicking the tires of poor old jonathan here because as you can tell there's an awful lot to this if if you think that any of these circumstances do or might apply to you get in contact because as as jonathan just quite rightly said everything is quite subjective to your particular circumstances so what did the uh, supreme court say specific on the causation element well, the insurers sort of appealed on the grounds that the but-for test should be applied to the losses. So in this sort of instance, the insurer's position was that even if a loss had occurred because of COVID and that they've been required to close the premises, so that triggers the cover, what the insurers tried to argue was that the loss would have happened in any event because everyone was told to stay at home and the national pandemic had basically shut most businesses down and stopped footfall coming through the doors. So essentially what they were saying was that, okay, you might have closed, but you wouldn't have had any business anyway because no one was going to come knocking at your door. Uh, quite a cheeky stance to wow, take. Wow, that's, that's harsh, is that? Particularly if you're trying to avoid having to pay out because of the the disease in the first place. You, you're pretty yeah. much saying, well, um, you wouldn't have made any money anyway because you everyone was told to stay at home. But uh, yeah. your business was interrupted. But because it's now been even more interrupted, we're not paying. 
<laughs> yeah. You can see why there was an awfully large litigation battle over this, the these oh, points, because yeah. you can see why the insurers needed to take this stance, and you can understand why, obviously, businesses as a collective didn't really want that as the answer. Yeah, that's it. I mean, as you say, it's a, it's a cheeky stance to take, but obviously policies are policies and insurers are insurers. It's now merely sufficient to show that the interruption was the result of government action. Is that right? Yeah, so pretty much the Supreme Court rejected the argument that the but-for test was necessary. Um, what they were looking at was that there were, in reality, no single events that caused it, but the multiple individual causes combined to cause the government and force the government to take action. A, a proverbial storm, shall we say. <laughs> yes. um, right, next on my list, I've got trends clause. What, what, what on earth is this? Uh, so trend clauses were provisions that the insurers had put in the policy, which effectively seek to exclude from the assessment of value the loss, which would have happened regardless of the insured event. So how does that play in this this particular case? So it's coming back in some ways to previous points made there. So the insurers argued that even if the proprietors had been denied access to their property, this didn't necessarily cause any loss. The fact that everyone had to stay at home and the wider effects of COVID then caused the loss going on from that. So it did offer the insurers, again, a second bite of the cherry to try and reject the claim on that basis. And dare I ask how the Supreme Court found on this particular point? Yeah, they weren't too happy with that point. And they kind of said, no, we're not going to go down that road. Um, they rejected that argument and essentially said that only circumstances which are beyond the insured peril would be considered. So the trend clauses don't affect indemnity. So realistically, the disease would not be a factor. So the disease being COVID in this case would not be a factor to take into consideration when working out what the insured would have earned had the insured peril not taken place. So effectively, what the Supreme Court are wanting to do and the whole point of having an insurance policy is to put the business back into the position it would have been in had COVID-19 not occurred and or the wider issue of COVID sort of causing all the further losses beyond that. Um, just put them back in the position they would have been and not take the disease itself into consideration. Uh, right, next, I've got pre-trigger losses. You're going to have to explain what these are, I'm afraid. <laughs> so in instances, the good example on this one is, say, a public house. So prior to the government closing all the pubs, I think one of the ministers had said about a week or two before they closed the pubs to say it's probably not a good idea to go to the pub anymore and you're better off staying at home. So a lot of the pubs during that time saw a massive drop in footfall. Um, you know, some of them were down to 30% of attendance, really. So what the High Court had looked at on that was that there was a measurable downturn in business due to COVID-19 before the insured event had triggered um, the cover. So the insured event would be the Prime Minister's speech or, or the regulations that shut the, shut the premises. Um, so what the High Court said was, uh, during that time, they had not been ordered to close. So the week before the sort of mandatory instruction to close, the insurers could take into account that their loss would be reflective of the downturn in business that had happened before the closure order came into place. Wow. Yeah. I mean, that's that again, that's a really, really complex point. People like me who had vulnerable people in our lives isolated well before the official government lockdown so people like me and people within sort of my type of circles were already not going to the pub well before we were told we weren't allowed to go to the pub and i guess that's the the, the difficult ability to factor between what was caused by people like me making a decision off my own back based on the information i was being given publicly and what we were actually being told and and what was therefore becoming actual law 
Um, I'm glad I didn't have to make these decisions. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of complex uh, matters to take into account. Um, because what's the diff- What's the difference between me deciding not to go to the pub and me not dis- going to the pub because I might catch a, a deadly disease? It, there's a fine line between you're losing business because you're just losing business and you're losing business because of all the things going on. I mean, it's, uh, yeah, it's horrendous. Thankfully, I'm not in charge of making the decision on this point. So what did the Supreme Court decide? Well, thankfully, they saw a bit of sense on that um, because obviously a lot of pubs would have had a massive drop in what they could claim because of the reduced footfall that had happened prior to being ordered to close, you know, would have reduced some of them. As I say, they were down to 30% of their regular turnovers. It would have been a massive drop for them if that had to be taken into account. So thankfully, the Supreme Court sort of changed the position to say that, again, in terms of pre-trigger losses, so what was going on prior to um, the the lockdown going on, they've said to ignore the effects of COVID-19 when calculating what the turnover would have been. And again, they've stressed that the position is to put the business back in the position it would have been absent, obviously, COVID happening. So when you've got a cover that attaches and covers you, Obviously, the Supreme Court is saying we're not going to take into account anything else. We'll work in, well, anything else, I should say, in relation to COVID. We'll work it on what your losses should be, and you should expect to recover what your losses are. So realistically, it'd be like a year-on-year comparison. Yeah, that's it. I mean, some of it, we look at it sort of three months, the the three-month period, and then the same period in the year before, and obviously taking into account the year's trading as well, um, and then try and work figures from that. Brill. Uh, right. What was the final point that they looked at? So one of the other get-out-of-jail clauses that the insurers brought to the table was um, a case called the Orient Express Hotels. Now, this was quite a complex case, Um well, it was because wasn't it Sherlock Holmes or was it Inspector Clouseau who had to figure out who'd done it? <laughs> <laughs> Did you just get that? Yeah, sorry, that took me a <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the case itself came from the outcomes of Hurricane Katrina and Rita that devastated New Orleans. And the Orient Express was a hotel within the city. And obviously, as a result of the hurricanes, the hotel itself was badly damaged. And they obviously made a claim for both the property damage to the hotel itself and for business interruption losses that they've incurred because the hotel itself was forced to close. The insurers brought no dispute that the physical damage to the building was covered, obviously, with all the damage that would have been incurred during the hurricanes that was fine. But what the court and the insurer argued was that the business interruption relation losses wouldn't follow. And is this very much similar to what we were discussing before, their argument being that if the hotel hadn't been damaged by by some miraculous miracle, it was the only building left untouched by these terrible storms, there wouldn't have been anyone in the near vicinity to want to use the hotel because everywhere else was devastated. Well, that's it. It's it's exactly the same argument. No one could get to the hotel, so no one could come from outside. And everyone else was, you know, sort of stranded at the same time because of all the flooding and all the damage that no one could actually get to or use the hotel. So at that point, the court kind of backed the insurer's argument. Now, again, I want to stress that this is in relation to terms within the policy itself and not a, a generalism. So it will, again, be policy and case dependent on on what how it works and i suppose we should also explain that this relates to an american business and is it is it there for american law are we are we looking at this slightly as a as a similar scenario as opposed to it being under the same legal jurisdiction it came before the high court in england i think it, it there were certain judges that were on the supreme court decision for this case that was sat in on the high court as well that made that decision at that time. Um, Their decision being, obviously, that 
the, but for the physical damage, the losses would have been incurred in any event because of the wider damage caused by the hurricanes to the local area. So the insurer was successful in arguing that there would be no business interruption loss because no one could get to the hotel. So what did the Supreme Court say about this then? Because it, it, it feels like a very similar argument to the one they were running for number five about the, uh, the pre-trigger losses almost. Well, that's it. The Supreme Court took the view that the case had been wrongly decided and overturned the decision entirely so that it basically cut the insurer's knees out at that point because they could no longer rely on that as a, as a case to substantiate their position, not to indemnify the the businesses that they insured. Um, they said that the but-for test was wrong to use. The damage to the area or the wider insured peril, in this case COVID-19, should not be taken into consideration when assessing the cover afforded under the terms of the policy. Now, my my understanding of the decisions that you've just described and have gone through there are very much that the courts have removed some of the major obstacles that were, were that the insurers were trying to rely upon to not pay business interruption insurance, but that there remains an awful lot of grey areas that still need to be determined based upon what your policy says, what your business is, what happened and when. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly the case at the moment, Mark. There's still a lot to sort of work through. Uh, as we said at the start there, sometimes it can come down to individual words within a policy. What does that word mean? So whilst the Supreme Court decision has brought a lot of the ambiguity away from where we were this time last year, um, there's still a lot to sort of think about and a lot to take into consideration when considering whether or not a policy will bite and afford coverage to a business that's that's affected. And how do businesses know whether this might be something that's relevant to them or to put it a different way, how can you guys help them answer that question? Well, what we do is obviously we would look through the policy and the schedule to see exactly what the policy says in terms of business coverage. Um, the High Court decision has, and the Supreme Court decision has put a lot of scope in place to determine coverage. Um, but obviously, every insurer has their own different word, their own different policy. And obviously, we'd have to scrutinize each individual schedule, each individual policy. And then obviously, we can advise further in relation to whether a cover would apply on that occasion. And what's the best way for people to get in touch with you, either because they believe that this is something that will apply to them and they want some advice, or um, if they want to get some more guidance on whether or not this is applicable? Yeah, I mean, the easiest way is either drop us a quick email, info at johnsonandboon.co.uk, or give us a call on 0151 637 2034 and we'll happily have a chat with you about it. Um, you can come to us as well through our social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, and obviously we'll have a, a chat with you and, and sort of help you as best as we can there. And what about the fees that are charged on this type of case? If Obviously people are probably going to be, if businesses are in such a situation where they're needing to look at relying upon this policy, one assumes times are slightly harder than they would have wanted anyway so what what sort of fees will they be looking to pay on this type of case yeah i mean we're offering to look at it on a no win no fee basis so as long as obviously the clients act in accordance with our terms and conditions if for whatever reason they can't proceed we wouldn't charge them for any costs that we've incurred in looking at the claim for them if they do have a successful claim, then we're operating on a success fee, and that success fee is 25% plus VAT from anything that they're able to recover from the insurer. So uh, there's there's no reason why they shouldn't want to try and get in touch to at least get their initial answers, the initial questions answered. Exactly, yeah. We're more than happy to have a chat and have a look at anything and see if we can help you. Well, that's fantastic. Well, thank you very much for that, Jonathan. That's uh I mean, I, I, I stressed at the outset that that was very much a cursory view, and I guess if you're listening to this and you're a business and it applies, you're probably not particularly bothered about the minutiae of 
of these this particular legal dispute you're more bothered about the outcome and how it affects you specifically so get in touch uh, as Jonathan mentioned email is a great way of doing it you can contact or book yourself in for an appointment through the mobile app which I mentioned at the outset uh, social media is great so Facebook Instagram Twitter LinkedIn or YouTube you can send a message direct post a comment on one of our posts um, or you can just check it and follow us and you can find lots of useful information and interesting content that gets posted on there from time to time anyway Jonathan thank you very much for your help today my friend I'm going to go and let you lie down now after having to go through that and explain it as well as you've just done <laughs> Thanks, Mark. Take care, mate. Thanks for listening, guys. Hope you enjoyed it. We'll check you next time. Bye now. Get social at Johnson & Boone on Instagram, Facebook and Twitter.